This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. This is episode 97, entitled, The Son of Man According to Daniel. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dustin Smith. As always, I am your host. What does the phrase Son of Man mean? According to the four New Testament Gospels, this title was Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself. In fact, he always spoke of Son of Man with the definite article in Greek. That is, Jesus thought that he was the Son of Man. What did he mean by this title, and what significance would it have made to his listeners? We observed in our previous episode that the Hebrew phrase, Son of Man, within the Hebrew Bible indicated a human being, often a generic someone, and regularly highlighting his mortality. However, there is another reference to Son of Man that stands between the Hebrew phrases and the writings of the New Testament. And that reference is in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. This phrase is written in Aramaic. But the important point about the Son of Man figure in Daniel 7 is that it appears to be the place from which Jesus drew much of his meaning behind his own use of his favorite title. So this episode is dedicated to understanding what the one like a son of man means in Daniel 7. What did the book of Daniel intend to convey to its readers with this phrase, and what can it reasonably tell us about the identity of Jesus Christ. Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today will be looking at the Son of Man in the context of Daniel 7. I'm going to read the first 14 verses out of Daniel chapter 7. It's a lengthy passage, so let's just pay attention and try to absorb as many of the details as possible. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying, and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boast. I kept looking until thrones were set up, And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. 
His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. So as we saw there, specifically in verse 13, we have the phrase, one like a son of man. The phrase son of man here in Aramaic is from the phrase bar inash, which is the Aramaic equivalent to the Hebrew phrase we looked at extensively last week, ben inosh. Hebrew and Aramaic are sister languages. In this vision, it is pretty clear that there are two camps in opposition. On one side, we have the forces of evil, and on the other side, we have the forces of good. We have the four beasts that come out of the great sea. That is clearly in the camp of the forces of evil. And we have the one, like a son of man, that comes with the clouds of heaven. So we have two camps one defined by the chaotic sea, the chaotic waters, and one defined by the clouds of heaven. On one hand, we have the four beasts that are influenced by the chaotic sea out of which they emerge, while the Son of Man, on the other hand, is presented with glory, dominion, and an everlasting kingdom. So we have one side which is chaotic and unstable, and the other side that is described as eternal and never-ending. The four beasts seem to thus be temporary, but the Son of Man possesses everlasting dominion and a kingdom that will not be destroyed. Luckily, the passage offers successive interpretations of this initial vision. We see that there is a description of the four beasts, and a description of the Son of Man, but that is not the last word in regard to the meaning of these actors in this visionary narrative. The passage goes on and gives explanation to it. So we need to allow the passage to define its own terms. I'm going to start again in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 16. I approached one of those who was standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me it made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the holy ones of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all the ages to come. That's Daniel chapter 7, verses 16 through 18. Now in some ways, this information is helpful, and in other ways, this info is puzzling. The four beasts represent four kings. That's what the interpretation tells us. And the Septuagint and Theodosians, translation of Daniel, both rightly regard these four as four kingdoms. The earliest Greek translations regard the Aramaic word kings as kingdoms. However, we do not have a similar explanation for the one like a son of man. Verse 18 just introduces the holy ones. It doesn't say that the son of man refers to X. The son of man actually is no longer mentioned in Daniel 7. Although it is suggested by many 
that these holy ones are the implied interpretation of the Son of Man. However, the holy ones is actually an ambiguous phrase, as it could refer to heavenly angels, as it most often means within the Hebrew Bible, or it could refer to the people of God, as it does within a few instances within the Hebrew Bible. So we are left with some questions. Good thing for us, Daniel receives further interpretation as the chapter goes on. I'm going to continue reading in Daniel 7, starting in verse 19. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boast, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the holy ones and overpowering them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the holy ones of the highest one, and the time arrived when the holy ones took possession of the kingdom. The passage goes on in verse 27. It says, Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the holy ones of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. That is Daniel chapter 7, verses 19 through 22, and verse 27. The passage continues and offers detailed treatment of the fourth beast and the little horn. We hear no further word about the Son of Man figure, unfortunately. We see the holy ones of the highest one taking possession of the kingdom in verse 22. The highest one is almost certainly another name for the Ancient of Days, for God. It is in verse 27, however, where we get the most helpful information for our inquiry. The dominion will be given to the people of the Holy Ones of the Highest One. So we have that phrase there, the people of the Holy Ones of the Highest One. We now have three categories in play. We have the people, the Holy Ones, and the Highest One. And we need to understand what these three each mean. While holy ones could grammatically refer to either heavenly angels or the people of God, the noun people always refers to human beings and never refers to heavenly angels. So we can safely interpret people as referring to the people of God. In other words, human beings. And we can make this interpretation with some confidence. So that settles the meaning of the people in the phrase, the people of the holy ones of the highest one. So returning to our phrase, we think that the people refer to the human people of God. We also regard the highest one as the ancient of days, a reference for God. So we understand who the people are. We understand who the highest one is. So this leaves the phrase holy ones. It would be unlikely for the holy ones to refer to the people of God that were already clearly mentioned. So the most likely remaining candidate is that the holy ones refer to heavenly angels. So the phrase people of the holy ones of the highest one in Daniel 7.27 would indicate the people of God defined by the holy heavenly angels who belong to God, the Ancient of Days. It is also critically important that we note that the holy ones as heavenly angels who receive the kingdom in verse 18 and verse 22 are further defined as the human people of God receiving the kingdom in verse 27. It is important to note 
that Daniel 7.27 is the final interpretive word within the entire visionary narrative. The ultimate final word is that it is the human beings, the people of God, who receive the kingdom. That is the final word of the unfolding vision. So, what does this mean for our phrase, one like a son of man? Here is what we can say for certain. Just as the four beasts represent four actual kingdoms, the one like a son of man represents an actual kingdom as well. The son of man is also a representative of multiple persons. The final interpretation in verse 27 indicates that these persons are the people of God, likely the kingdom of Israel. These people, of course, are represented by heavenly angels. But the point remains is that the single figure, the one like a son of man, is a representative of multiple persons. He is not the representative of a singular person or a singular angel. Since the people of God who inherit an everlasting kingdom are human, this further sheds light on their single representative, who is one like a human being, one like a son of man. So the ultimate interpretation that the one like a son of man represents the human people of God, this highly suggests that the one like a son of man is also a human being. Let's extend our survey to one of the surrounding and often neglected chapters, Daniel chapter 6. Our second point today is looking at the Son of Man in its immediate context in Daniel. I'm going to read a passage out of Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 16. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, the servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. That's Daniel chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. Some might wonder what this story, which is neither apocalyptic nor visionary in nature, has to do with the identity of the Son of Man in chapter 7. Consider this for a moment. There is a story here where ferocious beasts attempt to conquer a human being until that human being is aided and rescued by God and the human being emerges from the conflict in vindication. I suggest that this is the very same story we have in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel 7, we have a vision where the beasts are out of control. They are defined by the chaotic waters, and they are harassing the Son of Man figure, only to discover that the Son of Man is ultimately vindicated and rescued by the true God. The narrative is the same, and the actors are the same. The lions and the beast, the God of Daniel and the Ancient of Days, and, interestingly enough, Daniel and the Son of Man. The close proximity of this story in chapter 6 to the vision of the Son of Man in chapter 7 suggest that the author of the book of Daniel wanted to prepare his readers to recognize the Son of Man as a human being, just like Daniel was a human being 
in chapter 6. I don't think it's a coincidence that the ordering of the book of Daniel put the story of Daniel and the lion's den in chapter 6 right before the vision of Daniel chapter 7. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think that the story in chapter 6 leads us in chapter 7 to regard the human being that's vindicated from the beast in the vision as a human being like Daniel, who also was vindicated from the ferocious lion beasts. Our third point today is looking at the Son of Man in its biblical context. I'm drawing from the biblical theology of Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's Genesis 1, 27 through 28. It seems that the vision in Daniel 7 begins by depicting the upending of the original purpose for humanity as ordained in Genesis chapter 1. As we can see, humanity was meant to rule and subdue the animals. But there is a problem in Daniel 7. The animals are subduing humanity. It is only when the Son of Man receives dominion, glory, and a kingdom that humanity regains its rightful purpose as rulers over the animal kingdom. The conclusion of Daniel 7 brings back into order the purpose we originally see in the biblical theology of Genesis chapter 1. For the purpose of our study, it seems fairly certain that readers of Daniel 7 would recall the purpose of humanity, the vocation given to Adam, as king over the animals. And this purpose was set out in Genesis chapter 1. As the vision in Daniel 7 unfolds, it becomes clear that when God sets things right and subjects the animals, he does so by giving authority to one like a son of man. The parallels between Adam and the son of man imply that the son of man figure was both a human being and a royal kingly figure. So, in conclusion, we have observed that Jesus' favorite self-designation, the Son of Man, owes much of its meaning from its enigmatic figure in Daniel chapter 7. We set out to try to understand what the book of Daniel was trying to convey to its readers with this Son of Man figure, as well as guess what sort of significance Jesus might have drawn from its imagery. We first noted that the phrase Son of Man was a regular Semitic idiom for human being. This is the natural way that readers of the Hebrew Bible, familiar with the phrase, would have interpreted its meaning. Second, we saw that Daniel 7 concluded by indicating that the recipients of the never-ending kingdom given to the one like a son of man ultimately came into possession of the people of God. Although Israel is certainly represented by holy angels within the book of Daniel, it is the shared humanity between the people of God and the one like a son of man that makes the most sense. Daniel 7 thus regards the one like a son of man to be a representative of human beings, namely the people of Israel. Third, we observe that the placement of Daniel 7 immediately following the story of Daniel and the lion's den further suggested that the one like a son of man is a human being. The lion's den narrative depicted the human being Daniel vindicated from the chaotic beast in light of the help given 
by the God of Israel. This created a natural lead-in to Daniel 7, where the readers again find a human being vindicated from the chaotic beast with the help of the Ancient of Days. It is unlikely that the placement of the stories in Daniel 6 and Daniel 7 is accidental or coincidence. The former in chapter 6 sets the stage for the latter in chapter 7. Lastly, we noted that Daniel chapter 7 draws on the larger biblical theology of the primordial human being, Adam, who was set in charge of the animal kingdom. As God's vice regent, Adam, which is the Hebrew noun for human being, was to subdue and rule over the chaotic animals with a governing order. The opening drama of the vision in Daniel 7 seems to indicate that humanity is no longer in control of the animals, who are now identifying with the chaotic sea. Only when God steps in, and confers upon the one like a son of man with dominion, glory, and kingship. Does humanity ultimately regain its rightful vocation as rulers of the animal kingdom? By drawing on the biblical story of Genesis chapter 1, the vision in Daniel 7 indicates that this one like a son of man is indeed a human being just like King Adam was. If these conclusions are correct, then it is reasonable to postulate a theory that the historical Jesus, who referred to himself as the Son of Man, understood himself as a human being, a special figure who represented Israel, a man who was distinct from the Ancient of Days, one who would be vindicated from ferocious beasts, over whom he was destined to rule as a royal figure, a human being who would be the recipient of God sharing his own glory, that is, a divine prerogative, and one who would come to inherit an everlasting kingdom. We now have enough evidence to move into the New Testament Gospels and see how the four evangelists depict Jesus as the Son of Man. If you would like to support the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, please check out this episode's description for a PayPal link. If you are a first-time listener to the podcast, I would like to personally welcome you and encourage you to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. If you are a regular listener to the podcast, thank you so much for supporting the show. My name is Dustin Smith. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, you folks take care.